Hello, I'm Peggy Apple Woods, president of the Bennington County Beekeepers Club in Bennington, Vermont. And tonight is the first of three classes helping new beekeepers become familiar with keeping bees in Vermont. Tonight's class takes a look at the life cycle of the honeybee, takes a look at equipment that the beekeeper needs, and we jump right in with Jeff Battellini, who is the president of the Wyndham County Beekeepers, and he starts in telling us why do we keep bees. He tells us of a great place to keep bees, and he talks about how he got interested in beekeeping. Enjoy. This will possibly change your life. You'll find yourself starting to plan vacations around your bees. So you can go to different beekeeping events. You plan your vacations because it's warm season and you can't leave. Uh, but the reasons for beekeeping, my reasons in particular in my neighborhood, I'm up in the mountains just between Mount Snow and Stratton. And there are a lot of old overgrown farms around here with a lot of old heirloom apple trees. And the apple trees just weren't blooming. And they were blooming, they just weren't getting pollinated and producing apples. Uh, so I felt my reason was to help the pollination in my neighborhood. And since we got bees, we have more blackberries, more raspberries, more apples in the trees. And the more bees you have, the more flowers these plants put out because they're getting pollinated and the more fruit you end up. So it just keeps growing. It's a wonderful thing. Uh, there are lots of reasons to get into beekeeping. Pollination was mine. The honey, the honey comes along with it. That's a natural. Uh, you want to save the world. <laughs> Maybe that's not the best reason, but a lot of people feel that way too. Uh, but honey, honeybees are livestock. And you have a certain responsibility for that livestock. Uh, you need to learn. And that's why we see a good turnout here, people coming to this class, to learn. You wouldn't decide to get a couple of cows without learning. Uh, hope, hopefully, too many people have children without learning, but <laughs> puppies. Uh, you have a responsibility as a beekeeper to the animals. Let me see if I can. Okay. Uh, they need to be fed. They, they have needs. You just can't get bees and let them be. Uh, your bees most likely will not make it. There are certain times when they need to be feed, fed. Uh, they need to be treated for diseases and parasites when appropriate. Uh, swarm prevention is part of this management and there are a lot of management skills out there. As you see, they're quite diverse. This is the beginning. This is your first step for learning these skills tonight. And hopefully as beekeepers, once you get your bees, before you get your bees, you will continue this education and strive to become a beekeeper, not just a bee hatter, even worse, a bee hatter. Uh, but the swarm prevention, you might want bees, but your neighbor, neighbors may not. That's a skill that you need to learn to manage your bees so they don't end up in your neighbor's walls. So your bees don't become problems for other beekeepers getting diseased with and spreading their varroa around. You're also going to hear a lot of terms beginning tonight if you already haven't. Uh, some of this will sound like blah, blah, blah. Eventually you'll start getting those aha moments and it will come to you. But man, managing swarms. This is a swarm that happened in, from our beehive. I was inspecting bees in a back row of our apiary and one of the hives in the front was swarming and it just, the noise kept getting louder and louder. This is possibly one of my easier swarms, but there are a lot of wonderful stories in this. We basically put a box on the ladder and shook the bees into the box when I was standing up in the ladder and Leslie told me my zipper was open. <laughs> These bees were swarming all over me. Uh, where to put your bees and this is citing our bees uh, this is one of my favorite bee yards out there this is a friend of mine Richard's yard over in Westminster uh, he has full sun right here you can well, there are a lot of little points we're looking for that we'll get to but I'll point out some of them here 
uh, inciting your yard. You want the full sun, and that's just, it gets the morning sun, the afternoon sun here. It's wonderful. Forage, this hillside back here is full of basswood trees. So right around the 9th or 10th of July, when a lot of the other natural forage is dwindling, the basswood trees, the linden, are booming. And that's just a beautiful, clear, light nectar that comes in, almost a white honey. Uh, I like a bit of shade somewhere in my yard. And if you notice right down here in the corner, this is the trees. The wood line is right back here. You have some beautiful shade to put a picnic table and a chair to watch your bees and all your equipment. You can drive right to this yard with your bee boxes. You can drive right up to it. A lot of beekeeping is just moving, as you'll find, is moving one heavy box full of bees from one location to another. Whether it's with your inspections, just taking it off and stacking it right next door so you can go through. Uh, but the other thing, I like the shed right here. You store all your stuff. Storage is a big plus because you have a lot, you're going to end up with a lot. One of the tricks for some of this storage, like smokers, so you can keep an empty beehive with a cover there and store some small stuff in it. Bee yard considerations. A bear fence is a must. And in all these pictures, you're going to see a bear exclusion fence. Bears and skunks are our biggest problems. We have a lot of other problems, but that's what we can deal with with a fence. Uh, you want dry ground. We don't want our bees in a damp area. Uh, if you're at the bottom of a hill, you don't want them in a little depression at the bottom of the hill. Hopefully, they would, all that cold, wet air can sink into. Uh, we want a level spot. The morning sun gives them a jump start. My yard is the sun starts in one end and moves through. And those first beehives to get that first sun, they're up and active at 6 30, 7 o'clock in the morning. Some of the other ones don't get the sun because of some shading from some trees until 10 o'clock. But that morning sun helps them, it's a jump start. Uh, a water source, you're gonna read in all these books <laughs> that the bees need water, they do. I think we instructors have decided that that seems to be kind of a moot point in Vermont. There's not too many places around here that you're gonna be more than several hundred yards from the stream a river, a pond, a beaver swamp right across the street from me. And they're all over the mud and the swamps. Uh, your neighbor's pool, swimming pool. If you are in town or do have neighbors, the swimming pool is not Somebody muted me. You, you will have to deal with uh, creating some water there. And you can, there are ways you can put up, uh, you can create your own little water source for them. You don't want overhanging branches. And again, this goes against having that full sun. If you're under trees and branches, you're not getting the sun. Plus whenever it rains, you get that extra water dripping on it. And when it stops raining, it keeps dripping on them. And that actually I found makes for some angry bees. I've done a lot of pruning over the years in my yard. Uh, shelter from the prevailing winds. Uh, I think we'll talk about screening later on. Shelter can be a fence. It can be some brush, some, some shrubberies, uh, arborvitaes, some trees, just a tree line. And as far as the tree line, we like to keep our beehives at least 20 feet from the tree line with the fence. And what we found and what a lot of people have found is if a deer's in there and gets spooked, it tends to run right out of the woods into your bee fence. So I like that separation. Uh, space to expand is two or three hives can quickly, with the bee's nature to swarm, very quickly turns into four or five hives. So some room to expand room to work, allow yourself room to work around these hives and move around. And again, we have a bear fence here. That is, it's, this is a very nice yard. This is in Wilmington, Vermont, one of, another friend of mine. 
uh, in the morning sun. This one gets beautiful morning sun in April and May. That's so nice to get the bees out there after they've been shut in all winter long. Fences make good neighbors. An electric fence, again, if you have bees, you need a bear fence. There is one cub, there's another cub, and right there's mama. And these bears are about to find out that, that fence is electric and hot. And there's peanut butter hanging from aluminum foil on this fence. So they're going to taste it. Uh, you need to educate your bears. Uh, these bears will learn and have learned that this is not a really friendly area for them to be and they stay away from it now. And mama bear will teach her cubs that bee yards are either a great source of food if they have not been trained or to stay away from them. But the cubs do not teach their children. So every year you have to re-educate the bears. And how we do that is by putting peanut butter, or tuna, bacon, cat food, hanging it from your wires so the bears come down and taste it. The bears do not mind getting stung in the mouth uh, to get in order to get the brood from the beehives. The honey is the icing on the cake. The brood is their protein. The honey's the maple syrup on your pancakes. Uh, it's the carbohydrates. The bears don't mind getting stung in their mouth, but they don't like getting shocked that close to their brain. It really sends them scrambling. Uh, check your local laws. Make sure you can have bees in your neighborhood. Make sure there isn't an ordinance that says you can't. I don't think up here in New England we have many towns that deny us the possibility of keeping bees, but possibly there's a limit on how many bees you can have. And it's usually best, it's the neighborly thing to keep your bees as far from your neighbors and your property line as possible. Don't put them right up against the property line next to their swimming pool. You might have some problems. And again, the screening, shrubbery, a fence. And if you're gonna put your bees in your garden, you don't necessarily want the bees flying all around at your level. If you put a fence or a shrubbery or a barrier in front of that hive where they have to fly up to above your head level, and that's when they level off. Once they level off there and keep flying, they're out of your head range. We have a patio here at our house about 15 feet away from 10 beehives, and the beehives are up just a little higher. So when we're standing on the patio, the bees are going right over our heads naturally. But when we're sitting in the chairs out there, they're a good three feet above us and not a problem at all. So that's what I mean by screening. Fence, brush, shrubberies, a tree, a mother-in-law. Uh, 20 feet. This is my yard in Wilmington. Uh, we keep the bees. On our, I use pallets a lot. I actually use two pallets stacked on top of each other. I find that's a very nice height that I don't have to bend over that much to pick things up and put things down. Uh, and again, we have the tree line in the back, back there and there's about 20 feet of separation there, which also keeps the bears from getting too bold. If the bears can just stay in the woods, they're gonna be a bigger problem. But my takeaway with this yard is if you have beehives, you're gonna have bears around here you need a bear fence, and I use cattle panels that are electrified, and pallets make great st hive stands in Vermont, not so much in Pennsylvania. Uh, and it was actually a beekeeper from Granville, New York, that told me they don't like pallets up there because of the rattlesnakes. Anthony might be able to clue me in there. That's a copperhead in Pennsylvania. It's what we call a no probe. Uh, so that's about what I have to say for hanging, uh, where you want to place your fence, your, okay, where to place your hives. Out of sight, out of mind. Hidden hives are less likely to be vandalized, uh, less likely to be stolen, 
It's less likely to cause problems with any uppity neighbors you might have. So uh, we actually, our very first, Leslie and my very first beehives were stolen out of a yard down in North Carolina before we were two days before we were supposed to get them. I'd also like to talk about tracking your forage bloom. How much time am I, do I have, Peggy? Let me tell you, Jeff, you have plenty of time at this moment. So I would say you have another 10 minutes to 15 minutes and we also have time for questions. So uh, I think this is very important about tracking forage. And this is something that you are particularly excited about because once you start tracking, the forage, tracking the flowers. You have a good sense of where you're going to be in your, obviously, your apiary. And when the bees are bringing their honey in, correct? Yes. So in answer to your question, we have about 10 minutes. Okay. Fence is good, make good nays. The water's kind of, water takes care of itself. You need a bare fence. You're spending a lot of money on bees. Don't feed them to the bears. Do whatever we can do to make yourself successful. Not fencing your bees in is not going to help. Right, tracking your forage, Bloom. Knowing what your bees are on. Uh, I One of the first classes I went to with Dan Conlon down in Massachusetts, he told us to get a notebook, become a citizen scientist, get a notebook, and keep records. But he said, keep, get a notebook and keep track of what's blooming in your neighborhood. And I don't know if you, right there, it's, it's on the table. I, I have five years worth of bloom data in that notebook, which if we could get another 20 beekeepers to do that for five years, think of the data we could come up with for the state. You now we had uh, Samantha Alger speak to us. I think she was the last speaker at the Bennington Club. She just spoke to the Wyndham County Beekeepers Tuesday night from the UVM, from the Vermont Bee Lab at UVM. If we could take all this data from Vermont, spread out from Vermont and, and give that to a graduate student up there there's some tremendous science going on there. And what I'm seeing are just little, as I'm going out on the inter internet, I find these little blurbs. Of they keep it for a couple of months from a region. I think Saba has uh, some beekeepers over in Duanesburg that have a list of some hives, uh, some data there. But as I drop that bomb about the basswood, I know that the basswood flows and starts blooming every year right around July 10th. I also know that the last week in July to the first two weeks in August, we have nothing blooming out there. It's what we beekeepers this, uh, call a dearth. It's smelled almost like a darth, but it's slightly different. It's not a Sith Lord. It's a lack of nectar is the dearth. And right Right when that dearth starts is when the basswood is stopping to bloom. But there, if you have enough basswood trees around you, you can end up with 30 or 40 pounds of honey easily in those two or three weeks. Uh, but knowing what your bees are on. So Dan Conlon told us to get a notebook, keep track of that. It's going to give you a lot of data. You'll know when the day, you know, after a few years, you'll get a really good idea when the dandelion bloom begins. And the dandelion bloom comes right around the same time that the apples start to bloom, apple trees. And that is really the kickoff of our swarm season. That's when the nectar flow begins in the spring in a huge way. And that's what sends these beehives that have overwintered successfully into this explosion of growth. They're, the queen just increases her laying, more bees are hatched and emerge. Those bees become nurse bees to the more eggs that the queen's laying and it just compounds from there. It's a wonderful thing. But 
tracking my forage bloom was great. I kept that notepad when I was in Pennsylvania one fall around late September. A beekeeper down there asked me what my bees were on. And meth was not an acceptable answer, I realized. Uh, but I was able, able to say, because I knew this, that they were on goldenrod. They, the goldenrod honey was coming in. And as you become a beekeeper, you'll learn that that goldenrod honey, you can smell it. It smells sickeningly sweet, like a really funky, sweet smelling pair of badge sneakers. Uh, but there are all seven plus varieties of goldenrod out there and they start to flow, they start to bloom in the end of August. And that really is, that's our huge fall, fall flow as we call it around here in Wilmington and the mountains over here. That's pretty much where our honey flow comes from is the Japanese will not weed in the fall and the dandelions. Uh, not the dandelions, the goldenrod, the knotweed, and the asters are out there. But knowing what your bees are on, keeping track of this, you'll become a better beekeeper for it. And get a notepad. You see a flower bloom. If you don't know what it is, there are so many apps out there. It's also helped me get in touch with nature even more, because I know so many more wildflowers than I did before I started beekeeping. But when you see a flower bloom, in your bees range you know it's i'm driving to beddington and, and things are quite accelerated in beddington and brattleboro they're accelerated also uh write down the date and this is data we're going to have from all over the state and one of the graduate students i think brianna is uh from uvm from the bee lab is she's doing a study in this up at uvm this year and she is going to be recording the nectar flow with scales on her beehives as well so we're trying to get i'm trying to get involved with that also so we can get some yards from around the state just not in uvm uh, that's kind of where i'm ending up here i think uh, good luck and be happy there are pallets right there <laughs> there's a bear fence never stop learning about these fascinating creatures uh, your beekeeping career and adventures beginning now, it shouldn't stop. There's always something to learn there. And there, there's with the COVID now and the internet, there is so much continuing education. We've put together an incredible list. All of us, I think Peggy has that in the handouts of so many resources out there that it's a, it's a, probably the best time ever to be a beekeeper and with some of the diseases and the colony collapse disorder we're dealing with it's probably some of the worst times but there is so much research going on take advantage of it learn become a better beekeeper and enjoy peggy uh thanks an awful lot jeff and we do have our first question i wanted to point out to everyone i'm i'm sure you're hearing uh, new vocabulary, like the first time I heard the term honey flow. Uh, that is basically, as Jeff was explaining, when uh, the bees are starting to bring in the honey. And, and I can remember asking my first year, and I'm still learning, um, oh, well, how do you know there's a honey flow? And I got like weird looks. But uh, basically, Jeff, you can answer that question. And I have another uh, question from Leanne. So, Question number one is how do you know when you have a honey flow? And then the second question is the purpose of tracking forage to assist us in knowing it's time to do something bee related or just to understand what they're interested in or able to eat? And I think that's an excellent, excellent question. And then I have another one about fences, but those what is both, a honey flow? Those are both good, good questions. When's the honey flow? Well, right now the honey flow is not happening. The honey flow happens when the flowers are out there. You're going to see your bees. You're going to get your bees and you're going to watch them. And if, I take naps out with my bees. I go out there and have a sandwich and have a nap and watch my bees, take a glass of meat out. But that honey flow, your bees are moving in. They're flying home and you see these bees and, and 
you see light bees that are just zipping back and forth, but you see the heavy bees that are coming bombing in and tumbling onto the landing board. If they don't have the pollen baskets, the saddlebags on their legs, they probably have a belly full of honey. Uh, you need flowers to bloom. The honey flow really begins. First, we have the pollen flow with a lot of trees. The uh, poplar are, yeah, the poplar, March 19th is when the poplars start budding and the pollen comes from them. The pollen is the protein just as important as the nectar flow, the honey flow is the pollen flow. The pollen's the protein and that's what the bees use to raise the brood, to get all those eggs to turn into little bees, into grubs and then bees, the larva and then the bees is the pollen. Uh, the pollen flow starts first and actually the first flower that it's out there with the pollen is your skunk cabbage in the swamps. Uh, I think you'll find that around Shaftesbury some. I have seen it over in Bennington County not so much around here, but the skunk cabbage and then the poplar and you're gonna get some tree pollen, but the first and then the colt's foot as we started out with. The colt's foot is really our first bloom, but there aren't that many colt's foot. The dandelions are everywhere. And right in the heels of the dandelions are the apples. Uh, gill on the ground is going to be your ground ivy, the periwinkles. Oh, violets are starting to bloom. All, all your amphiorials, wildflowers are starting to bloom there in the beginning of May. And that's the beginning of the, the honey flow. And if you have, a, if you weigh your hives, your hives will be getting heavier. You're, you will be seeing more brood being produced. Uh, if you're feeding, I talked about feeding at different times of the year, and you're responsible for that and it's seasonally. Usually in the spring, uh, I, we start feeding to supplement our bees and to give them another little kickstart as soon as it gets warm enough to feed, which is usually the end of middle, end of April. Uh, when they stop taking that feed is a good sign that the honey flow is on, the nectar's coming in. So for example, Jeff, uh, in answering the question about the purpose of tracking uh, the forage, uh, yep. It is helpful, from what I understand, like you said, to know at the end of the apple blossoms, then you've got another season coming in. Do you use that as a way of knowing, okay, now it's the end of the spring flow, I've got to go and check now for mites. Do you have like a certain schedule? I don't have a calendar like that. I start checking for mites once I start seeing the bees growing. Uh, so I use the alcohol wash and I really don't like to kill any bees before we have a viable population. But the nectar flow, the very first time we use the nectar flow and tracking that forage bloom is <laughs> Mike Palmer teaches us, and these are more words and people. Mike Palmer is a very famous beekeeper from Vermont that has a whole slew of videos out on YouTube and he's been doing this for 40 years. He's quite knowledgeable, uh, quite academic about it also, and quite successful as a beekeeper. He manages and maintains over 1,000 hives in northern Vermont and new, northern New York. Uh, but he tells us that the pollen patties that we want to put on in the spring to stimulate feeding, and to stimulate brood rearing, the pollen patties should go on three weeks before the dandelions blue. Wow. And how do you, how would you gauge that? Just well, basically by your calendar? I mean, if you have a late spring. I, I go by my calendar and the dandelions are blooming anywhere from the 25th in six years, the 23rd of April to the 19th of May. No, I'm at 2,000 feet here between the mountains. So I'm a little different than a lot of people, a lot of you folks in Bennington County. But sometime I put, so I put my pollen patties on generally the last week in March. And that's a burst, burst of protein to stimulate the queen into brood rearing, to start her laying eggs. 
Now there's some pollen coming in, but hopefully the timing's right that it just overlaps everything else. It overlaps the nectar flow. And three weeks would be 21 days. And that's, you're gonna find out this in the B math, that 21 days is very important also. That's a brood cycle. So the eggs that the queen are laying are gonna hatch 21 days later. So we use the nectar flow. I just, I keep track of it all summer long. It's just, I'm just curious that way to find out what's blooming when. We have fireweed that grows around here. Out in Saskatchewan, Canada, they have entire honey flows that are based in beekeepers that chase this fireweed around in the mountains. And I've heard that they fill up a super, which is 35 pounds of honey a day on the fireweed. Now, if you watch the gold prospecting show, the, the, gold, the gold digger show on the Discovery Channel uh, in Alaska, I saw them comment that when the fireweed's blooming, they have 10 weeks of gold mining season left. So hmm. these, are, these are constants in nature. Uh, we have, we've had a couple of warm years, but we have a lot of cold years. Last year here, we were getting snow in, March, in May. I have a couple more uh, questions, Jeff. Go on. Uh, is there such a thing as a solar electric fence? Yes, there is. Uh, Man Lake carries a very good one that I own. Uh, it's not, Parmac makes one. There's a, on the VBA site, and I think it's in our paperwork, is a bear fencing presentation that Fred Putnam put together from Wellscroft Fencing over in New Hampshire. And they, Wellscroft is our closest buy local. I buy quality chargers myself and stay away from the cheap ones at Tractor Supply. Uh, go with the Parmac, go with some of the name brands. I have another question from Elizabeth. How soon can a hive be established in the spring with the variable weather that we have here in Vermont? If you can get your bees, I, huh, I'm leery about getting any bees between the, before the middle of April. You know, with our, that's me, I think over in Bennington, you might be able to stretch that. I really couldn't say there, but I would like to have my bees. The middle of April can be quite warm, uh, quite cold. I would begin, say the beginning of May at the earliest for me is what I'm comfortable with. Okay, Jeff. Do we have any other questions for this particular segment? We will have questions again after, uh, our other segments. So I'm just looking to see, does anybody have anything at this point? Uh, Jeff has some very good points. And again, you're hearing a lot of different things kind of thrown at you tonight. And I just uh, would just caution you just to be patient and you will eventually learn as we go along on this course. Uh, I know from my own experience, and I've been doing this for four years with my uh, husband, Dana, we have uh, had our trials and errors also. Uh, we did not think we needed a bear fence. Mm -hmm. We don't have bears. Well, uh, I can show you a presentation where <laughs> we got rudely awakened. And I remember having to call our instructor, Jean, and basically saying, what do we do now after we got attacked by a bear? But that's another story for another time. These um, days, well, go ahead, Jeff. These days, when you call the game warden and say, we've been attacked by a bear, what can I do? The first question he asks is, are you registered with the state? And that will come up in one of these following sessions, your state laws. Are you registered with the state? Do you have a fence up? This goes back to rule one. If you have bees, you will have bears. Okay. If you have bees, you're going to have bears. And if the bears get to your bees, you've educated that bear to go after every other beekeeper's bees. That's also part of the responsibility to everyone else. So, Jeff, did you basically come up with a timeline of how soon a hive can be established in the spring? I would say... I'm trying to get to that's that's this is my yard at my house we have a cage in the spring i would say may no sooner than may 
just for me because of the weather. Uh, I'm going to be ordering some queens probably this week so I can make some splits. And I'm hoping that they will get here the first week or so of May. Uh, trying to get some early queens to establish those bees because I don't want to wait until June or July like we usually do to get local queens. Any more okay. questions? I don't think at this point right now. Thank okay. you very much, Jeff. We certainly appreciate it. You're welcome. Uh, again, there is a, a, a so much information out there. Uh, and I hope that the resource list that we gave you helps a little bit. Those textbooks that we recommended will also help. Um, I think that Jean, who did a great job putting this together, the resource list, she had talked a little bit about some of the YouTube videos. And uh, you're going to see that there are you can ask one beekeeper a question and you could get nine different answers from other beekeepers. So you almost have to pick and choose in that respect of really who you have faith in with some of these uh, YouTube videos. There are some good ones out there. Um, I think we're going to move in. We were going to talk about equipment next, but we are going to just shift a little bit and I'm going to hand the mic over to Jean. So Jean, I'm going to ask you to unmute. Jean Davis was our president uh, prior to myself. She's done an excellent job with this organization. Jean, are you right there? I'm right there. I'm uh, working to do... Oh, my PowerPoint didn't pop up. It'll come up. The rest, the other, the whiteboard and the iPhone and the Zoom popped up, but my PowerPoint didn't pop up. It popped up this afternoon when we practiced this. <laughs> um, oh dear, what do I do? Let me get my PowerPoint in. Um, well, while we're waiting for Jean, Jean, why don't you try and find it? Um, hopefully you should be able to share your screen. Yes, okay. yeah, I will. And let's see where we can go from here. Uh, I'm gonna get my technical advisor. Sounds good. Well, Peggy, so, yes. Uh, so why, while we're uh, wait, waiting, uh, I'd like to just mention a few more things about the, the internet and YouTube as far Thank as- Thank you, Tony. That would uh, be wonderful. Sources, uh, as Peggy uh, said earlier on, uh, with COVID, uh, there has become uh, an abundance of videos and uh, lectures on, on beekeeping that are available. Uh, YouTube has, has a lot, they've had them for years. Uh, the thing with YouTube uh, that we recommend is basically, as a new beginner, uh, stick to the um, university-based uh, YouTube videos. In other words, uh, Michigan State, Penn State, uh, Georgia, University of Georgia, University of Florida, they all have apiary programs. And so they do a lot of research, a lot of training. And so their videos on YouTube are generally exceptional uh, to use and, and view. Uh, until you become a better beekeeper and knowledgeable and have some success, going to YouTube and looking at uh, videos by other beekeepers sometimes is not the best idea uh, until you get have the ability to determine whether they're good or they're not. And uh, uh, that, that's what I would, I would recommend as far as, uh, you know, doing, doing that. Uh, it just, uh, you, you run into the problem that everyone wants their five minutes of fame and that always doesn't uh, provide the best information. So uh, I would, that's where I would suggest. That sounds uh, very good, Tony. And Tony is one of our instructors, Tony Atnucci, and uh, 
he will be talking to us next week. Uh, right now, Gene, I think we're going to throw it to Aaron, who's going to talk to us about equipment. Can you hear me, Gene? Gene? So, Aaron? Hi, guys. Can you hear me all right? I can. Okay, good. Can you guys see my video as well? In a few seconds, I'm going to uh, tell yeah. Jean to... I'm going to stop this. And Jean, if you could stop your PowerPoint, we're going to throw it to Aaron right now to talk about equipment. Jean? Jean? Jean, we can. Um, I'm just going to throw it right to you, Erin, okay? Okay, excellent. Um, so okay. hopefully. You guys Let me introduce Erin Kylie. Uh, she is also one of our instructors. She has been a beekeeper now for about, uh, well, how many years, Erin, now? It's been six? Well, I spent, uh, I spent a lot of my childhood beekeeping up in New Hampshire, and then I took a break when I was in college and grad school. Um, I've been keeping bees in North Adams for the North Adams Mass um, for the last four years. Um, so as soon as I bought a house, I put more bees in it. Um, I'll tell you that beekeeping is a lot different now than it was when I was growing up in New Hampshire, um, you know, between 10 and 20 years ago, let's say. Um, and the big difference is um, parasites, but we're going to talk about those later in this course. Um, I'm supposed to be talking to you about equipment. Um, so I figure there are a few kinds of equipment that are related to beekeeping, and that's why you're down here in my basement workshop with me. Um, there's the hives that the bees live in, and then there's the equipment that you use when you're taking care of your bees or when you're tending them. Um, so the first thing I'll show is um, the hive that the bees live in, I guess first things first. Um, so um, I thought it might be good for me to use some of the spare equipment that I have on hand to show you just how from the bottom up a hive um, is. So pretend that this sheet of plywood is the bottom of your hive stand, um, right? Or the bottom of um, the platform or the pallet that you're using to keep your hives on. Um, so the first thing that you'll have, um, the bottom of your hive, is perhaps one of these things. Um, so this thing is just, um, sort of a, a wooden box. I painted mine purple. Um, there's no reason for purple. It was kind of the cheapest um, paint color that there was. Um, it's a great use for um, off-price weird color paints is painting beehives. So this kind of sits on the ground or on whatever other stand you've got. Um, and into it nestles one of these things. And it's called um, a bottom board. Right? So you've got a little wooden piece in front where the bees land and they crawl into the hive. Um, and it's called the bottom board because it's the bottomest thing next to the stand that it sits on. Um, so my bottom board has screen on the bottom of it. Um, you'll notice um, it's not a solid bottom board. When I was a kid up in New Hampshire, solid bottom boards were fine. Um, but now that we have a lot more varroa mites, which is a parasite you guys will learn about, it's advantageous to keep screened bottom boards instead of solid ones. So if mites drop off of the bees, they can't walk right back up into the hive. Um, so I have a screened bottom board here, and I have a sticky board. Um, so it's just a white piece of, um, I think this is like cardboard coated with melamine or something like that. Um, you can smear petroleum jelly onto it and you can slide it right in the back of the bottom board so that it's below the screen. Once you slide it in there, um, you can put it in, um, take it out 24 hours later and see what's on it. See what kind of stuff has been falling off of your bees. Um, you find a lot of bee legs on it, you find a lot of pollen on it, and if you find too many varroa mites on it, then that tells you some information um, about maybe reaching a treatment threshold. Um, so that's the bottom board and the sticky board that goes into it. Um, above that, um, some people, um, and I'm one of them, use one of these things. 
and it's called a slatted rack. Um, it's pretty thin. Um, it's maybe two and a half inches tall or so all around. And it's got these slats on it. And this just gives the bees a little bit more space. It's kind of like having a front porch on your house that you hang out on so it doesn't get too crowded inside, right? So when bees are coming and going, they're making all sorts of decisions um, about who's coming back, carrying what, carrying pollen, carrying nectar. Um, and they need to figure out where in the hive they're gonna go once they return. Um, so they hang out in the front doing that. This is to give them the space to do it. So it goes right on top of your bottom board here and it aligns with the back. So see how this kind of recesses that front landing pad for the bottom board? Um, all right, so then on top of that, um, you've got boxes. Um, so I use just boxes like these, right? It's made with box joints on the end, so it's nice and sturdy. Um, it's got recessed handles. You can make it yourself, or you can um, buy them fully assembled, or you can buy the pieces and assemble them yourself. Um, so kind of three stages for your comfort level with handiness. Um, so um, the box that I'm holding up right now is called a medium-sized box, and medium refers to the depth of it, right? So some boxes that are taller are called deeps, and some boxes that are shallower um, are called shallow. I don't know why they're not called um, small, but they're called shallow. Um, so I run medium ones, and um, I run eight frame boxes, and eight frames just means that eight of these removable frames, and I'll show you in a minute one with some honeycomb on it, but eight of these removable frames will fit inside. So I've got three frames that I'm holding up now because that's what I was able to grab off of my shelf. Um, but so the frames kind of fit right into the top and eight frames fit into this. Eight frame mediums are great for people like me without a whole lot of bicep. Um, so when they get full, they are not as heavy as deep boxes. Um, and they're not as heavy as 10 frame boxes. So when I was a kid in New Hampshire, though, I did have a big strong dad with biceps and we made our own 10 frame boxes. So I'll just kind of put my 10 frame one on top of my eight frame one to show you um, the difference in size, right? So um, this is probably as good a lesson in any in the fact that 10 frame equipment is not compatible size-wise with eight frame equipment. Um, you've got this space under here that anything can just fly right up into the top 10 frame box, right? So you can't mix the two. You've got to decide pretty early on if you want to use eight frame equipment or 10 frame equipment. Um, you know, if you have um, biceps that look about like mine, go for eight frame. Um, all right, um, so once we have, um, Right, so maybe it's time to talk about frames. Um, so frames are these things that honeycomb is on. Usually you don't see them empty like this. Mine start this way, um, but when the bees are done with them, um, they end up looking something like that, right? The bees will draw out their own comb onto this. Um, so, you know, essentially these frames and um, just like um, just like the boxes, you can buy them fully assembled from some places. You can buy the parts and assemble them yourself. Or if you're really intrepid, um, you can make all the parts and assemble them yourself. Um, but it's just a frame, right? It's got these tongues on the end of it so that it can rest um, on the rabbits on the inside of your box, right? Um, and mine is totally empty, but I have shoved tongue depressors. Um, so these... Um, just, just wooden craft sticks um, into the grooves in the bottom and the top. And that's so that the bees know what direction is straight up and straight down. And they will just um, fill in the comb right in between, right? So, um, so this is a full honeycomb from one of my hives that, um, that died with a hive full of honey. Um, so left me with a whole bunch of pounds of honey to harvest and it all looks just like this. Um, so um, you have these frames and they go into these boxes, right? Um, if it's a really good year, um, you'll have a big stack of boxes and they'll all be full of honey, right? Um, so I'll throw a couple more boxes on here just to give you um, the impression that I'm a good beekeeper and um, my bees are really productive. Um, well, that one's full, so it's actually not light. Um, all right, so once you've got your box stack as big as it's gonna go, um, the thing that goes on the top 
is an inner cover, right? This is just um, a thin frame. I have a notch here so that bees can use this as a top entrance when I want them to be able to do that. Um, and the way that they do that is if the notch is down toward the space that the bees live in, then they can travel out it. Usually that notch is toward the back, not toward the front, but I wanted you to be able to see it, right? See that little notch, right? Um, there's also a handle in here, right? Um, so you put this um, inner cover on, and then if you want, above it um, is where you feed the bees. So um, you can use just a regular mason jar um, like this with holes poked in it um, about the size of that cover, and you prop it on some sticks typically and put it onto the inner cover. And then um, you take another empty box and you put it over the top. Sorry about this um, noise. I've got an empty box here. You put the empty box over the top of the inner cover and that's where your feeder is. Um, and then on top of the whole mess to weatherproof it, you've got the outer cover and this recesses over the top. So this lip will, um, will go over the top edge of that. And it's got this um, galvanized metal on top of it to make it rainproof, right? Um, if you're choosing to make your inner cover right adjacent to your outer cover, make sure that the outer cover is slid a little bit so that the bees can still use the notch, right? Um, you don't want to put the notch there thinking they can use it and then block it. Um, all right. Um, the only other piece of equipment I see on my shelf that I forgot to show you guys is this. Uh, it's called an entrance reducer, right? So when the bees come home after a long day's work, um, they fly into the entrance right here. Um, we don't want anything other than our bees to go into the entrance, right? So we don't want yellow jackets or mice or anything like that. But we also don't want other people's bees coming into our hive. Or we don't want... Um, other hives of our own bees coming into particular hives. So we use this entrance reducer. Um, I got this one from Better Bee. Um, Better Bee is right out of Greenwich, New York. It's pretty close to us and they should have their catalog and website in our resource list. Um, but it's got um, a slightly larger entrance and I think that's mostly for people who use entrance feeders instead of the um, in-hive feeders. And it's got the smaller notch here. If you keep it turned to the smaller notch, um, it just goes right there, blocks off the entrance, and um, having a larger entrance, or sorry, having a smaller entrance means that my honeybees have to work a lot less hard keeping unwanted others out, right? So, um, right, so that was a very, very quick rundown of what a bee's house looks like. Um, Peggy, how much time do I have to suit up and show them uh, the bee suits? You have plenty of time. I'm worried that you might be a little cold, Erin. So do you want to go in, in where it's a little bit warmer to talk Putting to them? My bee suit will help a lot. Yeah, uh, it will. Usually I'm sweating in that thing. We all know how sweaty it gets in a bee suit in the middle of July. Uh, that's for sure. Jury's um, out on how sweaty we'll get in February, but let's go for it. Um, now, certainly, we definitely have time. And then we will have time for questions. And I think that everybody who is participating knows that we're just kind of hitting just basic points here. And then we have uh, time for questions. And as the course goes on, we can certainly expand. But we appreciate you showing us the hive. So continue, Great. please. Okay, awesome. Um, so that's where the bees live. Um, when I go to do an inspection or when I go out to my hive, um, I'm not going to go out dressed like this. Um, I'm going to be wearing, um, I am going to be wearing a full suit head to toe with a veil, um, but your level of comfort might dictate what you wear out to the hive. Um, so I suppose the people who are most comfortable um, will be wearing one of these and it's a veil only. It's got these strings on it. Um, and it comes with a helmet inside of it, right? Um, and it's got this screen on the front to keep it away from your face um, because if it touches your face, then so can the bees, right? <laughs> um, so um, to put on this um, veil, pretty straightforward. You put it over your head um, and you find the two strings. You pull them around your back and you tie them after you put them through the loop that's on the front, right? So there's a loop here. You feed the strings through the loop. 
right? You bring them around your body and tie it either in the back or around in the front. Um, I've always been a front tire myself. Um, do that with aprons too. All right, um, so once your veil, once your veil is tied on, um, if you're very comfortable just like this, um, you would get your gloves if you would like to use them. Um, and that's your protective equipment, right? Um, if it freaks you out a little bit um, to be wearing just the veil and the gloves and your regular clothes, um, that's because it probably should. <laughs> Um, I guess one other thing I'll note, if you're going out in veil only, pay attention to the color of your clothes. Um, if you wear something dark and fuzzy, bees will think you are a bear and uh, they will treat you as such. So um, the less you can seem to bees as though you're a bear, the better for you. Um, that's why a lot of bee suits tend to be white. Um, so speaking of um, other layers, um, another option if, um, if you don't want to go out in only the veil, um, is the jacket. Um, I've got a jacket here that comes with a built-in veil on top. Um, you can get these from beekeeping supply stores as well. Um, so, I mean, it's really just like, you put it on exactly the way that you think you would. Um, you <laughs> just put your arms in the arms um, and your head in the head and uh, adjust as needed. So, um, here's the jacket. Right. Um, mine comes with a cool pocket um, for, for your hive tool. Um, we'll talk about hive tools and other um, tools of the trade soon, um, but this is, um, this is the jacket and it, it doesn't have built-in pants, um, which means that I will be using something uh, a little more high test. Um, so when I suit up for my bees, um, I go whole hog. Um, I have a suit that uh, is just like coveralls. Um, so this thing um, has a hood that zips onto it at the collar. Um, it's got legs that are big enough to get on over your boots um, and you just put them on like regular coveralls. Um, so you go like that, you zip it up the front, and I usually have a veil that zips right onto this at the collar. Um, and I suit up fully every single time because I happen to be allergic to bees. Um, so, um, yeah, you guys get to tell everyone you took a beekeeping class with someone who's allergic to bees. Um, that often happens to people who grow up beekeeping and take a long hiatus from it and then take it up again as a hobby in adulthood. Um, it often happens to children of beekeepers when they become adults. Their immune systems learn really well how to deal with bee stings when they're little and then they don't get any bee stings. So when they start getting bee stings again, the immune system, I mean, this is my simplification, says, well, I know how to deal with this. Let's pull out all the stops. And it puts you into anaphylactic shock, <laughs> um, which is not the most useful thing. Um, and I discovered this after taking up beekeeping again as an adult. Um, I like beekeeping enough though, and it's not every time that I get stung that I go into anaphylactic shock. Um, it's just, sometimes. So it's a risk that, that I manage, um, which also means that I keep EpiPens right in my toolbox for when I'm beekeeping. Um, I also always take a little bit of ranitidine and um, I always take a tablet of Benadryl before I check my hives, um, just in case I do get stung, that lessens the likelihood that my body is going to freak out because of it. But that's why I suit up every single time. I've got some pretty, um, <laughs> some pretty um, gnarly gloves, um, then I wear the full veil. I put rubber bands around the bottom so the bees can't fly up my pant legs. Um, not that that's been a problem before, I just don't want it to happen. Um, all right. Um, so that's the, that's the rundown of the protective equipment that I use when I'm out there. Um, but there are other things that I use when I'm out there too. Um, so I keep this, um, boy, and this toolbox is a classic. Um, I keep this old toolbox um, just for my beekeeping stuff. Um, and what is in it now is what was in it the last time I inspected in the autumn. Um, so you guys get to, <laughs> you guys get to see everything. Um, a very sticky hive tool. 
Um, so this is a tool, <laughs> I know, it's, it's more sticky than it should be because I was using it for extracting honey recently. Um, this is a, a just a forged metal tool. Um, it's got a nail puller on one end. It's got um, sort of a lever or a hook on the other end. Um, and it's just got a flat um, end um, that you can use to pry with. And what you'll use the hive tool for is prying boxes apart from each other and for picking up frames out of boxes. You'll find that bees like to glue stuff down. Um, if you're not comfortable being sticky, um, then probably rethink beekeeping. Um, the bees make everything sticky in many different ways, with honey, with wax, and with something called propolis, which is like um, a tree resin that they use to glue like everything together. Um, especially if you don't want it glued together, they'll glue it together for you. Um, that's why we have hive tools. Um, one other word about hive tools is that they sell things that are shaped like this in many hardware stores that are blue. Um, you don't want those um, because those are not um, forged as strongly as these are and they don't have as much um, tensile strength. They'll just snap um, if you pry things that are too heavy with them. So you want to get a bona fide hive tool. They sell them at Better Be. Um, I think they sell dozens of kinds of them at Better Be. Um, find one that you like. Um, what else is in my toolbox? Um, now my hands are all sticky. Um, is one of these things. Um, it's called a frame lifter. It's got these, uh, it's got this spring in the top. Um, and otherwise, it's just, um, you know, on a little axis here. And you can use this to lift frames up. Um, I find that that allows you to exert a lot more upward force on the frame without breaking it um, to get it lifted up out of your box. So I always use one of these frame gripper tools. Um, let's see what else is in my box. Um, I've got a smoker in my box. Um, so is it the right time to talk about lighting a smoker? Um, <laughs> Typically in the in-person versions of these classes, lighting a smoker is one of our um, key activities. But every time we meet, we have a hands-on thing that we do. And going out and lighting a bunch of smokers and keeping them lit is, uh, is, is a great activity for a hands-on class. Um, but these things just open up. Mine is really gummed up. Um, so these things just have a lid that opens up. It's on a hinge. Um, it's got these bellows on the back and this little hole at the bottom of the bellows um, puffs air into that little tube at the bottom of the can. And the can is where the stuff burns. Um, I've still got some old pajama pants that were too ratty to give to Goodwill. That's my preferred smoker fuel, um, is clothes that are just too ratty for Goodwill. Um, one other tip that I have um, for smokers is that when you're rendering beeswax, um, so this will help after your first year, but when you have beeswax that you melt down and filter, you often filter it through pieces of cloth. Save the cloth and use it as smoker fuel. Um, it lights really well once it's coated with wax. Um, so cloth makes great smoker fuel um, and I'm never out of jeans that are too ratty to get to Goodwill. Um, so um, yeah, so this is the smoker. Um, lighting it and keeping it lit is an exercise in patience. Um, it only ever seems to get going real good when you're about to finish your inspection and wrap things up. Um, that happens to absolutely everybody. Don't feel bad if it's you, because um, it's us too. Um, all right, other stuff that I have in my toolbox. Um, I've got a bee brush. This is for brushing bees off of frames. Um, I use that a lot when I'm doing what's called an alcohol wash. Um, you guys will learn about these in our pests and pathogens um, lesson, but I keep um, a mason jar with a screened lid and a bottle of isopropyl alcohol and a white dish pan and a bee brush. Um, I keep them all right in my toolbox um, because I do um, alcohol washes for varroa, varroa mite preventions. And varroa mite is a word that you will hear again and again and again as a beekeeper, and it's always gonna be on your mind. Um, so if this is the first time you've heard about varroa mites, it will not be the last. Um, so, um, so I think I will let someone else explain the procedure for the varroa mite alcohol wash. Um, but, uh, but I always keep that equipment in my toolbox too. Um, the other thing I keep in my toolbox is um, a jar of rubber bands. Um, and I'll explain to you why I keep those in there. It's because um, 
when you saw me take some of the frames out of my hive, um, the new ones, um, and now I'm looking for ones that are not underneath a heavy box. Um, these new frames that I use um, do not have any foundation in them. And foundation is just a very thin strip of wax that's imprinted with a honeycomb sort of embossing um, on it so that the bees build from that thin sheet of wax or from that thin sheet of plastic. Sometimes the foundation is made of plastic too. I actually don't have any foundation here to show you. Um, I don't use foundation in my hives. And that just means that um, when the bees build out their honeycomb, um, it can break pretty easily. Um, so it also means that sometimes they build it crooked um, just because I want them to build it in sheets uh, within each of these frames doesn't mean they wanted to do it that way. And sometimes they will cross the combs in between frames. If I have to break them apart and reposition them, that's why the elastic bands are in my toolbox. I use elastic bands to resecure the comb onto the frames where I want it. And then the bees will fix it for me. The bees will glue it on more sturdily um, once I get the heck out of there with my rubber bands. Um, but that's why those are in my toolbox um, is because I don't use foundation in my frames. I'm a foundationless um, person. Um, which makes it really easy to do cut comb honey. Um, so I often give people gifts of just chunks of honeycomb. Um, and it's great to spread on toast. You can eat the wax. It won't do anything to you um, that's harmful anyway. Um, let's see. Um, it's about it for the bottom of my toolbox. Um, other beekeepers, is there anything I'm missing that's in your toolboxes? I feel like you guys are seeing me in my underwear or something. This is everything that was in there the last time I inspected. <laughs> <laughs> a mirror. What's that? A mirror. So I, I keep a small little compact, a lady's mirror. So if I'm in one of my out yards to pluck those stingers out of my face. When I'm oh, by hey. <laughs> All right. A mirror for plucking stingers out of your face. Um, yes. That's really hardcore, Jeff. <laughs> I just wear a veil. I don't know. <laughs> It, it happens occasionally. Oh, I can't. Usually after one of my naps. Erin uh, brought up some, some very good terms. Uh, foundationless frames. That's something that you will hear. Some people will do found foundationless frames, or they will use frames that has foundations, and we'll explain the difference between the two. She talked a little bit about Varroa mites. Again, this is a big thing in beekeeping uh, right now. This is a parasite that gets into our hives and that's what's killing the bees. And that is uh, probably scared me my first class too, going, what is this? And you learn a little bit more about that. Um, the beekeeper's best tool is the hive tool and you'll have your favorite one. You'll, you'll get to know which one works for you. And there are like a couple different uh, varieties of hive tools. I know my husband has a favorite one that he likes to use all the time. A <laughs> smoker. You definitely need to get a smoker. And why do we smoke the bees, Erin? Um, well, I suppose there are a few reasons why we smoke the bees. Um, so when I was first learning this, what I was told was that it makes the bees think there's a forest fire. So they fly into the hive, they load up on honey, but they accidentally load up on so much that they have a hard time flying around. Um, that sounded good when I was a kid. Um, then I grew up and learned that insects communicate via pheromones, right? So um, there are things that we can't detect with our noses, but these are um, chemical compounds that have odors that they associate with certain things. And one of the pheromones, um, and I just finished saying we can't smell them with our noses, one of the pheromones that some people can smell with their noses is what's called an alarm pheromone. Um, so different bees at different stages of their lives have different jobs to do. Some of them are out foraging on nectar, some of them are tending to the queen, um, some of them are making wax, things like that. Uh, one of the jobs that it's possible for a bee to have is to guard the hive. Um, so guard bees, um, it's, it's really all in the name. Um, they fly around the entrance looking for um, things that might be threats to the hive. These don't really sting unless they're threatened um, or unless they feel like they're threatened. 
or unless the guard bees tell them that they're threatened, right? So um, the guard bees tell the hive or tell the colony that there's a threat by secreting this alarm pheromone and the other bees smell it. And sometimes you can smell it. Um, I've smelled it in my own hives before. It's really distinct. Some people say it smells like bananas, but I don't think it's quite like bananas. Um, bees also don't think it's like bananas. Um, by the way, um, they don't react to banana odors the same way they react to, alarm, to real alarm pheromones. Um, but anyway, um, because it's um, this chemical compound in the air like a smell that triggers the bees to sting whatever is intruding upon them, um, one of the ideas of smoke is that it can confuse the bees that are smelling that thing, right? So if all you're smelling is smoke, right? It's almost like you walk by someone who has, um, I teach undergraduates for my day job and so many of them don't know how to do their laundry. If they've used tons of laundry detergent um, inadvertently, you smell it like a wall and it hits you. Um, if you're doing that, it's hard to smell anything else, right? So it's hard for the bees to smell the alarm pheromones when there's smoke in the air um, is kind of, you know, the second reason that I learned why we smoke the bees. Um, so how much should you smoke your bees? Um, when I go to my hives, um, I give a few puffs in the front and I actually take the sticky board out of the bottom of my bottom board and puff up the screened bottom board um, so it kind of travels into the hive that way um, and then I wait a little bit. Usually I've got something to do in the meanwhile, refill the feeder or something like that um, and then once I'm sure that they can smell the couple of puffs of smoke I've put in, um, I, I open up the hive and if it feels like they're getting aggressive and you'll know this by the sounds that you're hearing around you and the smells that you're smelling around you, if it seems like they're getting a little aggressive, I give a little bit more smoke. You don't wanna over smoke your bees because that in and of itself can make them angry. M much like me when there's an undergrad in the front row of my lecture hall who's just done his laundry in incorrectly <laughs> with, with super smelly detergent. Um, you don't want to smoke them out of town, um, but you do want to make sure that they can smell the smoke before you're working with them. It definitely does calm the bees. Yes. I've noticed that, and especially when you see, and you, you will be able to see this with your hive. You will be able to feel when they start getting a little agitated and that's when you kind of have that moment. I know for myself, I just back off. I appreciate the way you uh, kind of garbed right up there because that's the way I am. I did make the mistake once of uh, just wearing a white bee jacket and uh, black pants. Oh yeah. Like yeah. almost like black sweatpants. Sounds stylish. And uh, I learned my lesson because they <laughs> definitely uh, thought the lower half of me was a bear, and I got a couple of, <laughs> of good lessons on that one. Uh, the other a very good thing that Aaron mentioned, and Jean was also a big one on teaching me this, is Benadryl. Having Benadryl and keeping it because it, when you do get stung, and it will happen, oh. it's nice to have that nearby uh, and... Trust me, after you get stung a couple of times and you have those first reactions, it's not that bad after, after a while. And, and sorry, to, sorry to interrupt, but no, uh, one thing I kind of wanted to reiterate is um, EpiPens are also important to have even if you're not um, anaphylactically allergic to bees, because very often you'll be bringing people to to your beehives as guests. Maybe they're interested and curious. Maybe they don't know that they have an allergy to it, or maybe they develop a brand new allergy the day you bring them out. Um, sometimes you will develop a brand new allergy right out of the blue. Um, you always wanna have an EpiPen around. Um, I keep mine right in the toolbox. And most doctors, if you tell them you're a beekeeper and you might be bringing allergic people out to the hives and you wanna have one just in case, most doctors will write you a prescription for one. Thank you, Erin. Yeah. Does anybody have any questions that they would like? Jean? Um, I wanted to add to Erin's um, uh, EpiPen thing and say, if you ever do use an EpiPen, that person still has to go right to the hospital. Yeah. The, the EpiPen doesn't solve the problem in the long run. It solves it in the short problem, in the short time, and it gives you time to get to the hospital. Yeah, that's very, very true. And Jane, you, you can uh, talk a little bit more about your experience with that, perhaps uh, in a later class. Sure. Because it's a valuable experience that you shared with us uh, in the past. 
Oh, yeah. uh, Aaron, thank you very much. I, I'm still looking to see, does anybody have any kind of questions? Um, obviously, we'll have some more time afterwards. And if you note, I, I did put that the class is from 6.30 to 9. I don't expect that we go until 9 o'clock. I just wanted to give us enough time uh, so that everybody could just block that out. Thank um, you. Yes. Tom. Yeah. So I, I just want to add a couple things with oh, uh, that Aaron has talked about. Please. Uh, the the EpiPens, uh, they aren't cheap. <laughs> they last for two years, pretty much. So if you do get one and you're lucky to have insurance that'll pay for it, uh, make sure that when you get it from the pharmacy, they're, you're getting one that will will cover about two years uh, and not take, uh, take the ones where they're trying to get them off their shelf and they have less than a year of viability. Uh, they, they can still be used, but again, you're being shortchanged for the amount of money they're being paid uh, for them. Uh, the other thing about uh, stings uh, and the Benadryl is great. Uh, I have it all the time. Uh, my, my dog comes with me. I've given it to my dog when my dog has been stung. Uh, also uh, learn uh, a few treatments for stings. And if you go on the internet and just put in treatment for honeybee stings, they'll, you'll, they'll come up with about 15 of them. So be familiar with what you can do when you get stung. But what Jeff says is, when you do get stung, you have to remove that, that stinger and there's a way to do it. So you're not pumping additional venom into your body when you uh, try to remove it. So uh, you can learn about, about that. And the last thing, the smoker fuel, there's a lot of different things you can use for smoker fuel from burlap, pine needles, hay, um, the shredded, uh, wood chips, you know, for your gerbils or whatever you use them for. Uh, I learned last night at a meeting uh, that now uh, rabbit food pellets, which are compressed hay or something, people use those for smoker fuel, uh, or just the wood pellets now that they have in the stove. So there's a lot that can be used. Uh, Better Be does sell a cloth kind of material. I, I burn a lot of my my old clothes too. Uh, my wife loves that. Uh, she says you don't, you, you don't wear them anymore. And she's trying to make me look good or something. I don't know. But anyways, I mean, so you beekeeping to me is if you can get by without having to spend money, <laughs> try to do it. And, and, and the smoker fuel is one where you don't really need to buy it. <laughs> There's enough out uh, you know, I was with Jean one time and I think she was, had corn cobs and pine cones and you name it, I think she used. And I think people use uh, mushrooms, you know, whatever. So, uh, just, you know, there's a lot out there. Thank you, Tony. We do have one question about equipment, Aaron or Tony or even you, Jean. And that is, are queen excluders necessary to use? They are not necessary, but they can come in handy for a variety of different things. Um, people use queen excluders to separate the brood area from the honey area so that when it's time to pull out combs of honey, um, they don't have to worry that there's larvae and pupa in there. But you can manage your hive pretty well without People often call a queen excluder a honey excluder. It, it slows the traffic of the bees into those upper boxes. It makes it really hard, harder for them. But it's, it's a, so it's a screen that, um, that allows worker bees to go through and it doesn't allow drones or queens to go through. Um, but there are some management times when it's handy to have one for a while. Like if you're catching a swarm, you can put a queen excluder underneath the box with the swarm and it would inhibit that swarm from escaping again because they know their queen couldn't get out. 
So and there's some. This is good, Jean, because right now I'm going to introduce you because you are going to do the life cycle of the honeybee. And right. this is uh, probably my favorite part of the course because you learn, first of all, the most exciting thing to see is besides seeing the queen. I always enjoy seeing the queen, but there's nothing like lifting up a frame and finding eggs. And there's still such a thrill every time I look because you know when you have eggs in your hive, you know you have a queen that's laying. So we're gonna throw everything to Jean now and move right along. And Jean, I'm gonna mute myself and just tell us a little bit more about yourself before you start your presentation, Jean. Thanks. Oops, hold on, I just gotta start. There it is. Jean will go on to explain. Here we are. Okay, there you go. Go ahead. Okay, so I'm going to talk today about um, the anatomy of honeybees and the life cycle of honeybees. And my husband and I have been keeping honeybees for 39 years, and we still have a lot to learn. Um, and that's one of the really interesting things about it is that there's always a lot to learn. So here are some not so well-known facts. Um, how are honeybees, oh, different. If I have all the people showing on the right-hand side, it blocks part of my screen. There. How are honeybees different from wasps? Um, I always like to say to people, wasps have a waist. Honeybees have a waist, but you can't really see it. So they're sort of like looking like one fuzzy unit, whereas a wasp is very slender and you can really see its waist. Honeybees are descended from wasps, um, descended, evolved from wasps. Wasps are omnivores and honeybees are vegetarians. Honeybees are covered with hairs and wasps are not. Um, worker bees can sting once. Queen bees can sting repeatedly. Drones have no stinger, they can't sting, and wasps can sting repeatedly. For a bee to be able to sting repeatedly, it means um, that its stinger is, um, is smooth. Oops. A wasp, sorry, a wasp and a queen honeybee have smooth stingers. Um, a worker honeybee has a barbed stinger so that when she stings, it pulls out of her body and um, she dies. So she is not inclined, um, she's not inclined to sting if she doesn't have to. Um, so, that's, that's one, there's, there's probably more differences as well, but that's what I came up with the other day. What makes a honeybee better than other insects at gathering pollen and nectar? Those hairs on a honeybee um, just collect a ton of pollen. And when a, when a bee is um, vibrating and visiting a flower, there's actually an exchange of, electron, of electric charges that often make the pollen jump from the, flower onto the bee. Um, and in addition to just the fact that they are so teddy bear-like covered with hairs, um, they have several um, specialized body structures. Um, so on the back leg of a worker bee, there's a thing we call a pollen basket. And it's just a structure of almost spines that the honeybee cleans her the pollen off of herself and she packs it into that structure. And it becomes a little pellet on each of the back legs. And when she makes it back to the hive, she then um, removes that pellet and packs it into a cell. Um, if she's collecting nectar from flowers, which she's often doing, she has a separate crop in her body called a honey stomach um, that stores the nectar, and she carries that back to the hive in that special structure. So they're really, they have become designed for this uh, job. Um, 
honeybees are also better than other insects at carrying, at gathering pollen and nectar because honeybees live in huge colonies. And one of our hives doing well could have more than 40,000 bees in it, most of them worker bees. So they just can do so much more gathering than, you know, than bumblebees that have a couple hundred in their, in their colony or, or other insects. Whoops, sorry. And the last one here is what is a social insect? Honeybees are called social or eusocial insects. And they're related to uh, termites, ants, um, some other bees and wasps that all have this kind of social structure. Social insects always have overlapping generations within the colony. The queen is always, always laying eggs. There are always new babies being born during the growing season. Constant generation of, of a workforce. Um, there is cooperative brood care. And so there are, there are individuals in the colony who take care of the babies. Um, and that doesn't happen with a lot of other animals that, you know, besides the ones who are giving birth. Um, this, is, this is everybody's job at a certain point in their life is to care for the babies. Um, and social insects have a sterile worker, worker caste. So in the honeybee hive, that worker caste um, are all the females who are not queens. They are sterile, they don't mate, and in a honeybee hive, they do all the work really that happens in a hive. They are very, very important, and very, very numerous. Um, and because of all of this, this social insect, um, a honeybee hive um, is, I forgot the word I wanted, but um, it's, it becomes an organism itself. The, it's almost as if the individual bees are cells in the body of this greater organism. They function as a whole and they all work to take care of the whole. And these are the individuals who live in one colony. So here is the worker bee. And when you see honeybees out there in the fields, this is what you mostly see. Um, the worker bee is, a, is the um, unfertilized female and they all end up being sisters and they have brothers and here are the brothers called the drones they're they're bigger they're wider um they have really really huge eyes the worker eyes are smaller but the drones need to be able to have exquisite vision so that they can see a queen flying more than uh 30 feet to 300 feet in the air and they can see her and they can zip right up to where she is. And then here's the queen and every hive usually has just one queen and she becomes the mother of them all. Um, she is fed a special diet um, from, from the very beginning and that diet is called royal jelly and they feed it to her for her whole life. Um, the other bees as they develop are fed royal jelly for three days and after three days they start to get a different mix that isn't as um, concentrated with all the wonderful things that make this bee able to develop um, ovaries and, and a reproductive system that just never stops. So in her life, in her busy seasons, she can lay up to 2,000 eggs in a day. Um, she's, she's really special, but she's the only one in there. You can have 40,000 workers and a couple thousand drones and one queen. This is a quick look at, um, at honeybee anatomy. On the left, it's um, exterior body parts and on the right it's interior. Um, 
And I'm only going to point out a few here because we're going to go into some on, a, on other slides. Um, this, these are both diagrams of a worker. Um, and so on this one, if you see my cursor, there are these little spots that go down the side here. And these are, um, oops. These are um, entrances to the lungs of the honeybee. And a honeybee doesn't have lungs like a mammal has. Instead, um, they have trachea and it's an open breathing system. The air comes in and vents out. And so the holes are called spiracles. Um, but the first thing about, a, about an insect is that it has three major body parts. It has a head, a thorax, and an abdomen, and six legs, three pair of legs. Honeybees also have wings, so they have two pair of wings. And each pair is hooked together um, and the wings themselves are hooked to the thorax. So the stinger is at the end here. Um, there's a, we, we have a better shot farther on of, a, of the head. Um, and if we jump over here, the digestive tract runs all the way through these body parts and the anus is in the, in the very back end. Um, there are no blood vessels. There's free floating um, hemolyph, which is the insect version of blood. Um, and instead of a heart, there are arteries that are just pushing, but it's, it's sort of all open inside there for, for blood and for breathing. Um, there's the honey stomach. Um, respiratory muscles, the rectum. There's a poison sac that feeds the stinger. Um, so we'll move farther down. So we're still in the head, going head, thorax, abdomen. Um, honeybees see differently than we do. They have five eyes. Um, and the two eyes that you would notice are large on either side of the head. And in between them are three small eyes called ocelli, and they measure light, le light levels. Um, the large eyes are compound eyes. They have thousands of lenses. And those eyes detect color, light, sun orientation. Um, and I think both of them uh, give information about movement. The, the flower on the left is a flower that you would see in a garden. The flower on the right is the same flower um, with the kind of vision that a bee would use. Because a bee um, sees ultraviolet, but it doesn't see infrared. So this is a, a photographic rendering of what this would look like in ultraviolet. They don't actually see the color red. Um, but this is the way the photograph shows it. A lot of flowers under um, ultraviolet would show rays that we can't see with our vision. Those rays end up directing bees towards the center of flowers like runways to say, come here and fertilize me. Um, and while you're at it, you can have a snack. So anyways, it's, they see differently than we do. And you'll see that some beekeepers paint their hives all sorts of different colors. Most of them avoid painting their hives red because it's just not a useful color to the bees. It probably looks more like black or dark brown to them. A lot of what happens in a beehive happens because of glands and pheromones. Um, and the food that is created for uh, the bees that are that are babies that are uh, once the once the egg hatches into a larvae, it, it is fed substances that come from several glands, and that substance is called royal jelly. 
one of the glands is in the forehead. Another one is uh, down here. And there are other glands in other parts of the body that contribute other things to them. So here are the compound eyes. Here is the ocelli. Um, and then they've got antenna and the antenna um, also give information on pheromone smells, um, but they also are used for touch and navigation. Um, and they are used in the, in the processing of beeswax, make, in the forming of it into honeycomb. The mouth is made out of several parts, but they act like straws. Um, they, they can suck up um, water, nectar, they can suck up and move around honey. So there's a lot going on in the head. Now this is the middle body part, which is the thorax right here. And it's the home of all the motor um, movement and muscle musculature in the bee. So there are two pair of wings, one pair and the other pair. And they are attached by some kind of hooks to the wing muscles. In the wintertime, the bees can disconnect those wing muscles and still vibrate the, the muscles without activating the wings. And that vibration of those wing muscles creates heat to help the bees stay warm in the wintertime. They've got three pair of legs and the leg muscles are all, are, the legs are all attached to the thorax. Um, here is a pollen basket that's filled up with pollen on the back leg. Um, the front leg has got cleaners on it. It helps, they can clean their antennae with those cleaners. It's just different kinds of spikes or, or more solid hairs that they can use. Um, and there are spiracles on the thorax as well as the abdomen for breathing. The abdomen is the longest part of the body and lots of interesting things happen there. So um, when a bee has had a rich diet in uh, sugars, its body can start to create wax and the wax is exuded in these little scales that come out of underneath the abdomen. They come out and then the bees manipulate them um, and start to build wax home with them. Um, the, this back part of the bee is in segments and those segments um, on the top are called turgots and on the back, on the underneath side, they're called sternites. Um, the sternite part is a place where that parasitic mite often lodges on an adult bee and it's hard to get it out of there. So here's a person having been stung and uh, the bee has stung this person. It's still, the stinger has released from the bee, but it isn't, there's uh, some kind of filament, body filament that's still connected. The bee will then uh, die. It, may, it might take five minutes for the bee to die, but um, she can't survive without that part of her body. Um, so there are four pair of wax, wax glands back here that will produce wax. There's more uh, spiracles along the edge of both sides of the abdomen. Only female bees can sting. There's a gland in the back of every worker bee called a Nasanov gland. And it's um, easy to observe bees using that gland. Um, there are times like when a beekeeper opens up a hive where you might see a whole row of bees who are sort of sending out a message to the others like, come here, come here, something's going on. And they're waving their, their butt up in the air, uh, sending out that scent. Uh, the digestive, digestive tract ends through the abdomen and so do the, the reproductive organs are there as well. Um, and the heart muscles. Mm -hmm. They used, somebody used to say it's great to be queen, but maybe not in this case. Um, the queen is really special, but 
we named her queen. Um, she doesn't actually rule the hive. The hive ends up ruling her. Um, but here are some special things about her. She's only the only mated fertile female in a colony. She's developed uh, amazing ovaries for egg production. And she has a storage sack to collect semen. So she mates with 10 to 20 drones who lose their lives when they mate with her. And she stores all of that semen for her whole life. When she runs out, then she's kaput. In, she's kaput in that um, if she's still living in the hive, the bees will, um, will kill her if she can't lay eggs anymore. Um, she, she has pheromone glands and sends out pheromones that tell the rest of the colony that she's there and that she's healthy and that all, all is right in the world. If the queen gets lost, um, or dies and they don't smell that pheromone anymore, it changes everything about the hive. Their, their behavior changes, they start to panic, um, but they start to develop some of the eggs that they have into the next queens as well. She doesn't make wax. Um, so her life is, after she's mated in the first couple weeks of her life, she stays indoors for the rest of her life, laying eggs um, every day until the colony uh, reaches a really large population and comes to the decision uh, to swarm. If, if that happens, then she leaves with the swarm, but otherwise she lives indoors in the dark um, her, life, her whole life. She becomes an egg laying machine. She doesn't even feed herself. She is fed, cleaned and managed by her daughters. So here's a little uh, drawing about what a developing bee looks like until it's born. Workers, drones, and queens all go through this stage. A queen lays an egg. That egg, after three days, hatches. And when it hatches, then workers start feeding it. And for the first three days, all of the different kinds of uh, bee larvae are fed royal jelly. And after that, um, only the queen, the queen larvae are fed royal jelly completely and the others are getting a mix that's um, honey and pollen and royal jelly. It's, it's a little watered down. When the larvae, so the, this larvae is fed maybe a thousand times a day. It's amazing. And it grows and it grows and it grows. And when it gets to the top of its cell, so these are the cup cells you see in the honeycomb. When it gets to the top, the workers then seal over the top with wax. And for the next period of time, that, that uh, larvae is turning into a pupa. It's metamorphosing from what looks like a grub to what looks like a sort of uh, very pale albino bee, hairless bee. But towards the end of its development, it develops pigment, it develops hairs, and um, it, it finishes all of its uh, neurological development and when it's ready to be born, it chews open its capping and it comes out. So that process from, and it comes out as an adult. So its childhood is in these other forms. Um, so it takes 21 days for a worker bee to be born, 24 days for a drone male bee to be born, and a queen who gets this really specialized food takes only 16 days to be born. She's, she's on a fast track. Now this is a similar picture, but it goes a little farther. Once a bee has been born, its first job is to clean out its bedroom, is to clean out where, where it just developed. And then its next job is to be a nurse bee and to eat a lot of pollen and to take care of the larvae that are coming along behind it. After a certain number of days go by, um, that bee can become a, a bee that's producing wax and building comb and, um, and capping over cells. 
And, you know, each of these jobs lasts some, some amount of days and then it moves on and it might become a guard bee. It might become an undertaker bee who takes out dead bees or um, there's, a, there's just an amazing amount of different things that it could become. But it isn't until the last period of its life that it goes outside the hive and it, be, and it becomes um, a bee that is a forager that's going out and collecting uh, pollen and nectar and bringing it back into the hive. So in the middle of summer, the worker bees are doing all of these things. They're working so hard, uh, especially when they get to the stage where they're foraging that some of them only live three or four weeks. And what happens is they wear out their wings. They are working so hard, they wear out their wings and they die. They don't make it home or they just can't fly anymore and there's nothing more for them to do. Um, but the bees that are born at the end of the summer, um, hopefully are very, very healthy because those bees need to survive um, often for four months and take care of the colony through the winter until the next batch of bees, because brood rearing stops in the winter and starts again at the end of the winter. So bees can live anywhere from three weeks to four months. Now this is the life cycle of the whole colony. The honeybee colony is a super organism and the whole population lives to support the group. When it develops to what it views as the limits of its size, this colony of bees, uh, through a democratic process, they actually have a, a behavior uh, that simulates voting. Um, they come to a group consensus that it's time to split the population in half. So this is reproduction of the whole colony. One half will leave, roughly one half will leave, and the other half will stay behind. And the work, the, the ones that leave uh, will leave with the old queen. And the ones that are left behind will have uh, started to develop new queen cells. And at the time of the swarming and the leaving of the old queen with half the bees, it's just before the new queens are being born. So one of the new queens will head the new colony. The ones that leave have to find a place for a new home. Um, then a swarm will come out of a hive and be this great big mass of bees in the air. And then uh, they'll, they'll maybe lodge themselves on a fence post or a branch nearby and they send out scouts to find a good cavity somewhere. And once they've, if they find more than one cavity, there's a kind of a voting thing that goes by where they, a lot of the bees will check out both cavities and then they'll all sort of, um, through consensus building, decide which one they want to move to. And Traditionally, bees have done this in trees, in hollow trees, but not just there. Uh, and the, these days, they'll also do it in a building. And uh, that becomes a job for a beekeeper to deal with often. The, the swarm bees had filled themselves up with honey before leaving, and that triggered their wax glands. So as soon as they find a place to go to, their wax glands are already um, operating and they're able to start building comb right away. If you were to purchase bees in uh, the format that we call a package, that's a little uh, screen suitcase that three pounds of bees are sent to you with uh, that have a separate vial with a queen in it. Um, they don't come with any honeycomb. Package bees um, get poured into a hive box with frames and they've got to draw out comb right away. So we make sure that we feed them sugar syrup so that their wax glands can operate right away. Um, and as soon as the wax starts to be, have some of these cells that are finished depth, 
the queen starts laying in them and the workers start putting food away. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the very first job that they're doing is, uh, you know, is, is tending babies and putting food by. Um, let's see. So these are, you know, they spend the whole summer raising babies and collecting food. And by the end of the summer, they've collected enough to get them through the winter. All works well. Um, honey is not what they get from the flowers. What they get from the flowers is a liquid called nectar, which is very, very diluted um, sugar that the plants produce. And a, and a bee collects that nectar and carries it in her crop back to the hive. And in that crop, it mixes with some enzymes from her body. And when she gets back to the hive, she spits that nectar into the mouth of another bee. That bee adds her, her enzymes to it as she then deposits it in cells. And the enzymes um, change the nature of that nectar and the bees also um, do a lot of fanning to dry it out so that it goes from being an almost 100% water solution to 18% or less water and then you've got honey um, and another thing that they do with it is they create something called bee bread and bee bread is pollen stored with nectar honey and enzymes bee bread um, can look like any of these colors it becomes food for the hive that goes through a fermentation process that makes it more digestible because the pollen in there is good protein for them, but it isn't as easily digested until it's fermented. So the raising of brood is ongoing all spring, summer, and early fall. The queen lays eggs. They look like many, many, many grains of rice. They Once they hatch, they are floating in food and they start to look like a little C-shaped grub and they grow and they grow and they grow. And when the cell is filled with the grub, um, with the larvae, the bees cap it over. And so the cappings are made of wax. They're slightly fuzzy, slightly convex. Um, and underneath those cells, the bee continues to grow and change. And this is the pupa stage where it's, it's changing from looking like a worm to looking like a very pale bee. The, the capped brood of queens, drones, and workers all looks different. So queen cells look like peanuts and they're vertical. The bee, the bee is so big, she can't fit into a regular honeycomb. So they build queen cells on the surface vertically of the honeycomb that already exists. And when she's born, she's gonna chew her way out the bottom. Drone cells um, are larger than worker cells and they're more bulbous. They, they're called bullet-like shapes because it, the drone is a bigger bee. And then the worker cells are almost flat, slightly concave, slightly fuzzy. Um, and oftentimes queen cells are not, queen cells can be built in the middle of a frame or along the bottom edge of a frame hanging down. Um, and there are, there are different uh, things you can tell. If the, if the cells are built in the middle of a frame, that can be called a supersedure cell. And that might be assigned to the beekeeper to look to see whether or not the bees are trying to replace a queen that, um, that they don't like anymore, that she's not been laying well. Uh, queen cells along the bottom are often called swarm cells and they may be an indication that the colony is, is preparing to swarm. Happy birthday when a, when a 
bee is born, she has to chew her way out. So here's a worker chewing her way out. Here's a drone chewing his way out. And here are queens chewing their way out. And they, they look a little funky when they first come out. It takes a day or so for them to really look like adults, but they are. So the colony grows and grows all summer. Bees make more food. Uh, honeybees in, in commercial beehive, in beehives that we have usually make more food than they need to get through a winter. One of the very few animals in the world that actually would do that. Um, so a beekeeper can, can gauge whether or not there's enough so that there can be a harvest for the human as well as leaving enough food on there for the bees for the winter. Um, one of the things that happens as they're collecting food all summer long is when a bee finds a really great source of pollen or nectar, on her next trip back into the hive, she will do a dance. And if you look at some YouTubes of, of bees dancing, you'll see really great videos. She shakes her butt and she often goes in a circular or a figure eight pattern. And the orientation of her shaking and of, of the pattern she's walking in tells bees how, um, what direction the floral site is in. Um, and it has to do with the angle to the sun, um, but also the distance. So it's, it's a pretty amazing thing to see. If you ever see an observation hive with a glass or plexi side, you can often watch uh, bee dancing going on during the summer season. By the end of summer, there'll be a lot of frames like the one Aaron showed us like this. There, um, This is all honey. And when the honey got to be 18% or less, the bees covered it over with wax. And that wax protects the honey. It could, it could stay there and not spoil for hundreds and hundreds of years if, um, if it wasn't dented or anything. But this is the end of the summer now. There'll be a whole lot of these kind of frames in there and the, um, the weather starts to get cooler and the bees start to prepare for winter. And one of the first things that happens when it really gets cold is the drone bees are kicked out of the hive. They're not allowed to re-enter and they freeze. They haven't, it's like the grasshopper and the ants, they have not done the work of collecting food all season long. And so it's too expensive to uh, take care of them all winter. They did get fed by their sisters all summer. Um, so that's one of the things that happens. And another is that the bees start to condense into a cluster that's sort of like the shape of a ball. And the cluster goes between frames um, and they keep the queen towards the center of the cluster and in the middle of winter, they can keep her at 90 degrees. And they do that by staying close together and by shaking, vibrating their wing muscles, disconnected from their wings. The queen has stopped laying eggs by, by the middle of fall and um, they're preparing for the long winter. Bees don't want to defecate inside their hives during the winter, but they can't hold it forever either. So you might see that on a January thaw day that um, there'll be little yellow mustard colored spots on the snow and that's them having uh, gone outside for a cleansing flight to poop and then go back in and they don't all make it back in. Sometimes you see some dead bees on the ground. Um, if they can't get out all winter long, they will defecate in the hive. Um, and those years when they really just can't get out to do it, there, um, there's times that when they get dysentery from, from not being able to avoid as often as they'd like, as they would benefit by. Um, towards the end of winter, the queen starts to lay again and uh, the bees will expand the size of their cluster so that they can keep that new brood warm. If there's an incredible cold snap, they may lose some of that brood um, if they can't keep it all warm. 
And in March, some floral resources Jeff was talking about start to become available. Maple is another early one at my house. Uh, crocuses, when they come, it's just wonderful. The bees will just roll around inside the, cro the crocus blooms. It's really fun to see them. Um, but that pollen stimulates more brood rearing. So spring comes, April, May, June, the populations are on the rise. Uh, increasingly, there are more flowers and more different kinds of flowers. Um, and at some point, the hive again decides that it's, it might be time to reproduce and to, to divide into, a set, into two colonies. Um, so the workers in preparation for that start cells like these that are called queen cups. And these queen cups are often empty until the bees need them. But if they think, oh man, we might be going in the direction where we're gonna need another queen because we might be heading towards um, swarming, they've got these cups ready. And then uh, when it really becomes apparent that that's going to happen, they'll usher the queen towards these queen cups and she'll lay an egg in each one and they'll develop those. Those eggs are developed and when they're almost ready to be born, the old queen leaves the hive. And when the new queen uh, emerges, her first uh, task is she sets about declaring herself by trying to get rid of the other queen cells. And she'll sting them through the cell and kill them. But if another bee is also born at the same time, they'll fight. And on the occasions when they fight, um, the winner becomes the new queen of the hive. But if there isn't a winner and they kill each other, um, then the hive can be in trouble and it can become queenless. And it would need the intervention of a beekeeper who might just have to um, figure it out. Um, if there's no new brood in four days, if there's no eggs laid in four days, then the beekeeper would uh, perhaps have to go and uh, get a frame from another colony that has queen cells or uh, buy a queen. That new queen who was born and is now going to head up the old hive um, will take a few orientation flights. And then um, after a week or so, she will take her mating flights. This is a photo of um, a mechanical drone with a queen on it. And these are drones, way, you know, at least 30 feet up in the air and maybe much higher who see her, her and all are trying to mate with her. And there are some videos of things like this going on on YouTube that are just amazing to see. Uh, because this, you know, this happens 30 to 300 feet in the air. We can't see that from the ground. She may go on several mating flights and mate with 10 to 20 or even more drones to get a life lifetime supply of semen. Um, and after each one of those flights, she goes back home to stay inside for the rest of her life and be the mother to her colony. And it's a bee's life. Thank you, Jean. You're welcome. Jean brought up so many different uh, words and, and- Yeah, lots of vocabulary. <laughs> a lot of vocabulary. Uh, cleansing flights, cluster, winter bees, the life cycle of bees, package bees, nukes, drone cells. And the most fascinating for me are the, and, and the most confusing always for me, are the supersedure cells, the swarm cells, and queen cups. Yeah. Learning about those were probably the hardest part for me to comprehend. Is this a swarm cell? Does that mean they're leaving? That was probably my biggest fear when I first started as a beekeeper. Uh, oh, they're gonna swarm. And right. then I started to relax and realize that is part of beekeeping and it happens. Although I will confess, I have never seen a swarm, but that does not mean that I did not have a swarm. Well, and they don't automatically swarm because you see those cells. Sometimes, you know, they're just there for spares. 
We have yeah. a couple of questions, Jean. Okay. Um, uh, one of the questions, uh, is it helpful to cover the hive with insulation? Oh, well, some people say yes, and some people say no, because if you have six beekeepers, you have eight opinions. Um, I do cover mine, but, you know, sometimes I have the same success rate as somebody who doesn't. Um, and for many years, I covered my hives, uh, wrapped my hives with tar paper and had an insulation board inside the top outer cover. But for the last uh, three years, I've been putting insulation boards around the outside as well as on the top, and that's worked well. Um, it depends if you're going into winter with a really healthy colony, they can probably handle anything. Um, but one thing you can think about is if you, if you saw a hollowed out tree, the wood of a hollowed out tree is much thicker than the wood of a, of a wooden beehive. So there's more insulation value for the bees in the wild in a hollow tree than the bees in our beehives. So some people like to help. And there's lots of information out there about different ways you can do it. Um, but the jury's out on what's the very, there's no one right way to do any of this. And that's part of the challenge for everybody. Jean, so, there's, yeah. there's also the consideration of where you have your bees, as far as where you need to either wrap or not wrap. Sometimes you can get away without right. uh, wrapping, but if you are, are, they're in a windy spot, uh, I would at least wrap with tar paper and yep. then put on what Jean says. On the top, I would put the insulation board. That's where they're losing most of the heat right. is it's through vertical. the top, but uh, wrapping will at least cut down wind blowing into the hive uh, where they haven't filled up the cracks with propolis and yep. stuff. But again, like Jean said, you can wrap them and have the same success <laughs> as people who don't. And a lot, there's a lot of reasons why. Right. Thank you, Tony. We also had another question. Uh, actually, a, a point that Aaron wanted to bring out too with our hives, especially in the winter, is using what is known as a mouse guard. And a mouse guard is exactly what it sounds like. It's a piece of metal that goes in front of the hives uh, that keeps the mice out. Um, if so you if you, you can you can spend money on a really nice fancy one, um, or you can just get some half inch hardware cloth and bend it and put it in the front, so the mice don't seem to get through a hole that is uh, half an inch or less but the bees can easily get through a half inch hole. And then we had a, another interesting question. Uh, we have a participant that is interesting in uh, starting a top bar hive. Uh, Jeff, you did a good job answering that question, but why don't you uh, expound a little bit on what a top bar hive is compared to the hive that Aaron was showing us? Okay. Aaron was showing a Langstroth hive, what we call a Langstroth hive here in the United States. It was developed in the 1860s, I believe, right down in Greenfield, Massachusetts by L.L. L. Langstroth. He was a preacher down there at the con con Congregational Church. Uh, there's a memorial to him there in downtown Greenfield. It's a little bit of history. We actually have quite a bit of history right around here. Some of the first queen rearing techniques in the United States happened right down in Shelburne, Massachusetts in the 17 and 1800s also. Uh, but these top bar hives are more properly called a Kenyan top bar hive. They were developed by the Peace Corps to be used in Africa that in itself kind of scares me as to how do we think they're going to work in Vermont with what I'm dealing with six months of snow on the ground here. Uh, I So many beekeepers that I know, we refer to them as a novelty hive. It's so much better 
to develop a strong foundation with a Langstroth hive first. Overwinter bees for several years. It's hard enough with standard equipment that everyone's used to, that you can find a mentor for. Uh, the top bar hives can be overwintered successfully, but it's experienced beekeepers for the most part. And experienced beekeepers, I mean beekeepers that have several years of experience under them. Uh, the bees naturally, as Jean said, naturally in nature live out in hollow trees, which is vertical. Part of the top bar hive, it's a horizontal hive. And you're trying, we're managing the bees to fit our nature and designs enough as it is but naturally they want to live and move vertically. So we're trying to make them move horizontally. And when it gets cold in a tree, the honey's above them and they just keep moving up slowly. Uh, to convince them to move horizontally, I've seen, I've seen several top bar hives that have just starved right out because the bees, there's plenty of honey, but the bees don't want to move horizontally. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, uh, yeah, I'd like to add two things on the top bar. Oh, certainly. Uh, so, like Jeff says, there's what they call the canyon hive. But nowadays, they're also calling a top bar uh, a horizontal hive, and they're using Langstroth frames in it. Uh, it's still horizontal, uh, but it doesn't, it's not, it's built a lot sturdier than the uh, canyon hive. Uh, but again, the concept of horizontal beekeeping is is a different uh, dif different one and you may not find people that can help you with that. Uh, just like the flow hive that's mm. out there. Uh, everyone thinks, oh this is great. Uh, I got this extra six hundred dollars to buy one but they don't learn beekeeping and they don't succeed. Uh, the other thing about the top bar is uh, the Southern Adirondack Beekeepers, which I'm a member of, uh, our next speaker on the 22nd is going to be Christy uh, Hemingway, and she wrote one of the books on top bar beekeeping. So if you're interested in, in finding out more information, uh, let me know, and I, should, I could probably get you the uh, link to uh, attend that meeting. It'll be on a Monday night at, at seven o'clock. And so you're gonna hear it from, you know, someone who, as they say, wrote the book <laughs> on she top did. card uh, <laughs> beekeeping. She lives in, in Maine, which, right. you know, is baffling uh, <laughs> that someone up there would consider it uh, because they don't tend to succeed that well and overwintering in the north. That's great, Tony. And if I can get that link, I can send that out to everyone uh, for next week. Do you yeah. have the date on that again? Uh, it's going to be the 22nd, which will be after next week's class. So I, I can I can make it available uh, then. Great. At the We're class. getting ready to wrap up. We have just about uh, 10 minutes. Uh, before we sign off and get ready for our next uh, getting together next Thursday. We did have one question about uh, getting bees. You know, what is the best, where is the best place to get bees? And that's going to be a tough one this year. I think Jean uh, and Tony and Jeff, we've all kind of been talking amongst ourselves and, and we find that a lot of the local beekeepers are not going to have uh, many packages to get to for us to buy. So I guess does anybody want to take this one? Uh, I know that you did put it in the resource genus uh, gene and the resource list. So um, since the resource list was made, we've heard back from some of the people on that list, and um, Better Bee still has packages and maybe nukes, uh, listed anyways on their website. Um, but there's one in Shaftesbury, they're not, they're not taking any more orders. That was the how, however wild apiary. 
John Letourneau um, is not going to be selling any because he's had a lot of losses this winter. And Antoine Fahey, who's also on the list, um, is not going to be selling any more than what he's already signed up for. Um, so those three were our really close by people. Um, there's a place in Northampton, and I think I put that on the list, Red Barn, um, and they're, they're selling. Um, so, so far I know that the Red Barn is, and it better be is. Does anybody know of any more? Yes. Oh, yeah, and, and Tony knows of um, if, Mr. I, Roth Rounds. Yeah, uh, Lloyd, Spear Lloyd Spear in Albany will be sell, selling overwintered uh, nukes and possibly spring spring nukes. They're developed in the spring. I didn't put uh, him on the list. Yeah, he's, uh, I mean, I can provide anybody with the, his information. Yeah. Uh, sometimes you can, your agways and even uh, tractor supply uh, has, has them. They're going to be a lot more pricier than some of the other vendors because obviously they're paying almost, you know, full price and then they, they need to make a profit. <laughs> right. So uh, you could, they could be $40 more than what you would normally pay for something. But they, they do have them. Uh, I've seen some ads already uh, for them. Uh, again, our, the Saba, the Southern Adirondack Beekeepers site, uh, you know, has a market area where, where members will sometimes list uh, nukes or that they're selling. You know, packages are coming up from Georgia, so that's where you're going to get them from. Nukes can be local, and if you can get a, a local nuke, it's advisable because uh, they just are more acclimated to our our weather and stuff. And quick, quickly to reiterate what a package versus a nuke is, Jeff, why don't you take that one? Yeah. Uh, package is that three pounds of beans, uh, bees with the queen in there. It's, they aren't a family. That queen is not guaranteed. Uh, it's, they shake a bunch of bees out of a bunch of hives until they get three pounds in that little box that Jean spoke of, and they package a queen in there. They are not related, and it's not even like a swarm, but packages are one thing. Uh, I want to add there is a brand new, I mean, this is brand new. I just got an email this morning in Greenfield, Massachusetts, a brand new bee store. It's maggiesfarmandapiary.com, one word, M-A-G-G-I-E-S, uh, farm and apiary. They have nukes for sale. And this is, this is, uh, I don't have his name here. This is a, a this person learned from Dan Conlon and worked for Dan Conlon, one of Dan Conlon's mentees. He is, Dan Conlon has come up here. These will be Russian bees. They're purebred Russian queens and it's nukes for $210. There are a limited number of those. And a nuke is five frames of bees, usually could be four, with a queen and the queen is laying and there are cells, there, there's frames of brood, there are frames of eggs it's an accepted, established mini nucleus colony. Uh, and I, th I think Putin can vouch for him, right? Oh, yeah. Putin? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I you can. And on, I, that, on that note, I am going to say good night to everyone. <laughs> uh, I would imagine we will have some handouts for our next get together, which will be next Thursday at 6.30. We'll be discussing uh, how to do an inspection. This is a good thing to know. Uh, hopefully we'll have a demonstration of how to do an inspection on Zoom. That'll be very interesting. Uh, <laughs> the best way to learn how to do an inspection, and all the other instructors will agree, is to go and watch someone do it. And everybody has their ways of doing it, but just from the beginning of suiting up to the end 
uh, my husband and I, we like to tape our inspections so we can look at the tape later just to see what, what, what's there. You know, do we see eggs? Did we see a queen? Are they, um, you know, aggressive? What, what's going on in our hives? So we'll talk about that next week. We'll talk about pathogens and some of the diseases of bees. It's very, very important. This is something that um, the bee inspector is uh, being, uh, especially here in Vermont, they're being very strict about making sure that all our uh, hives and apiaries are registered. And they also want to know what is our plan to take care of our mites? How are we planning? How are, because they're going to happen. It's, it's there, but what are we doing and how are we being responsible beekeepers? So we'll talk about that next week. Please send us your questions. This is probably things that you're thinking about. Read your textbooks. Dean, Jeff, Tony, anything you would like to add? Aaron, do you have anything you would like to add before we say goodnight? If you haven't gotten um, uh, the Backyard Beekeeper, the Bennington Bookshop can order it for you. It's a nice, oh, it's a nice yeah. book. Yeah, I got that, but Gina's going to ask you if you're going to share your presentation. Um, so this is being recorded. So the recordings are going to be shared. Is that what you mean, Elizabeth? Yeah, I guess that's fine. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. So, so Peggy, we'll try to get this recording up in the near future, right? I can do a couple of things. I'm going to try and upload it to a YouTube channel and send everyone the link. If that does not work, I'll send the link out. Okay. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for joining us tonight. It was uh, obviously a big experiment for all of us. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank you for all of your information. It's been wonderful. Thank you, everybody. thank you very much. So everyone have a very good night and we will see you next Thursday at 6.30. Okay. Thank you. Good evening and good luck. <laughs>